the Easter Sunday message uh, is titled Resurrection Witnesses, and it comes from the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. And as always, if you don't have your Bibles, uh, the words will be on the screen for your encouragement. This is the word of the Lord from Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, Christ has risen. And it's something that you have gifted and ordained by your sovereignty. And it's something that you give to us, not only as a symbol and sign of your presence and victory with us, but as an encouragement, as the thing that gives us hope, as you gift us the Holy Spirit to live in us and around us, and to be the reflection of your grace, to be the people that you have and are redeeming to your end. And today we celebrate that, that no matter where we are in our faith, no matter where we are in our families, in our work, in our studies, that we can have confidence and the hope of the fact that the grave is empty and that Christ has risen in victory over sin and death. Would you help us to celebrate that today? Would you help us, Father, to trust in faith that you have instilled within our hearts? And would you and the Holy Spirit continue to foster that as we mature and we grow and are sanctified to live in a greater assurance that you are truly our Savior and Messiah and King. Help us, Father God, today as we sit under the authority of your word. Help us as a church to be good soil, to not only hear, but to listen and obey. Father, help me as your servant to speak well. In answer your name we pray. Amen. Beloved, again, happy Easter. Christ is risen. Uh, in the nerdy Greek, I would say to you, Christos Aneste. Um, the angel of the tomb earlier in the book of John says to Mary and Peter and John as they're looking frantically into this grave that Jesus was first buried in three days ago, he says to them, he is not here for he is risen. And what's astounding about that statement is that it's not only otherworldly because dead people don't come back to life, but it was the fulfillment of the promise of the gospel. It was what Jesus had told his unlistening disciples, and though they were unfaithful, and though they abandoned him, and though they were broken, and though they were unworthy, and though they etc., 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 he still went to the grave for their sins, for our sins, and he fulfilled his promise of redemption. And this is what the church is celebrating today. On Good Friday, a couple days ago, we talked about the punishment and the suffering servant in all humility that Jesus became willfully in our place so that we would be able to celebrate his name today on Easter Sunday. And this is what we are remembering, that he went to the cross in our place, he took our suffering and death, and not only did he pay for our sins, but he is now victorious. That's our hope and joy in faith as Christian disciples remembering and celebrating his resurrection. By faith we are then, this term that the sermon title holds, we are resurrection witnesses. This is a loaded term because resurrection is something that is at the crux or the heart of the gospel, and witnesses then tells us who we are as recipients of the grace of God and what we are supposed to do in terms of how you and I live, how we are identified, and the purpose that we hold in our lives. The text tells us of the story of the disciples, which mirrors our time, maybe not in time and context, 
but we are just like the disciples now living in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are all eagerly anticipating and waiting for his final return to fulfill and finish the promise of victory and hope. And so when they had gathered together with Jesus after the resurrection, and if you read the Gospels, they first didn't recognize Jesus when he appeared before them. Two, they were scared and thought he was a ghost. Three, they needed assurance for this, and Jesus is still patient with them throughout this whole process. And finally, after all this is done, Jesus and the disciples are gathered after the resurrection, and the disciples ask him this question. They say, Lord, Jesus, Rabbi, Will you now finally restore the kingdom of Israel back to power? Looking at it from our perspective, aren't they a little frustrating? Isn't this question frustrating? Because they asked him that as they were walking towards Jerusalem, towards his crucifixion. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm here about. I'm not here about an earthly kingdom. They ask him this question in Jerusalem. Lord, is this where you're going to overthrow Rome and restore God's people? And Jesus says, this is not what I'm here about. I'm not here for an earthly kingdom. I'm here for the eternal salvation of, this, of your souls. And now they asked him, after the resurrection, after this astounding promise fulfilled... Finally, Jesus, will you finally do what we think you're all about, what we want from you? Jesus answers his disciples. And the fact that he answers them is crazy love. He says, it's not for you to know when or what the Father is doing. It's not about your priorities It's not about your process. It's not about your planning. This is challenging for some of us because even now as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are primarily, we struggle with primarily being led by our own desires and our own feelings and our own agendas that we have for the church, for the gospel, for our families. And yet Jesus is saying, it's not up to you. It's up to the Father. The Father who has loved you in your unworthiness. The Father who has been faithful to you, though you continue to fail. The Father who even now is being patient in mercy. Still, they didn't see the clear picture. He says, it's not up to you, but, and this is a giant but. He says, after I'm gone, you will be filled and gifted and blessed with the Holy Spirit. You will be given godly power and authority. In my victory, in my resurrection, I am, not, I am now leaving you, but the Holy Spirit will come, which happens in the next chapter in Acts 2, and in the Holy Spirit, you will find your purpose and your identity and your conviction, and in the Holy Spirit, your purpose will be to go to Ju- Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, yes, to the very ends of the earth, to bear the gospel witness of who I have been, of who I am and what I will do. We could end the sermon here, and it would be the world record for the shortest Easter sermon of all of Christendom, but this is crazy. The love of Christ for his disciples, the 12 men who have betrayed, who have been foolish, who have been stubborn, who have fought amongst themselves consistently and constantly for the wrong priorities. Jesus is saying, not only am I in love with you, not only have I died for you, not only have I been resurrected for you, but now I will even use you to be my messengers, to be my resurrection and gospel witnesses. That's what you are more than anything and everything else. To be a witness comes from the word martyr. And that might be scary for some of us. To be a witness comes from the word martyr, and a martyr is simply a person who goes to tell of what they have seen, of what they have experienced, and what they know. Here's the hard part. Regardless of what it might cost them, and regardless of what might happen to them. This isn't some biblical thing that Pastor Paul or other Christian leaders made up, but this is the word in the Greek that Jesus expects and calls us to and in the Holy Spirit will equip and empower us to become not mere Sunday Christians, not mere attendees, but witnesses of the gospel by the grace and power of God. One who goes and tells, declares, 
in word and action of what they have seen, of what they have experienced, and of what they believe, no matter the cost, even to death. The disciples called the discipleship out of the victory of the resurrection was to be Christ's witnesses. And it's interesting here that Jesus mentions three specific places, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Jerusalem represents where they're from. It's local, it's comfortable. They're surrounded by people and places in the community that they like and love. Now, honestly, with all transparency, it's hard for me to be the love and reflection of Christ to even people that I like and love. But it's supposed to be the easiest, right? And then he stretches them a little further. And he says, and then you're going to go to Judea. Judea is still familiar, but it goes beyond their inner circle, their inner comfort zone. It might cost them a little bit. It's like if you go from San Jose to Oakland. Not home, but kind of home. It's all part of the Yay area, or the Bay area, as they call us. I don't know why they call it the Yay area. But Judea represents going beyond our comfort zone, but we're still kind of okay, and we're familiar kind of with the people and the culture, and it will will cost us a little bit of something, but it's going to be all right. As a good Christian, we're willing to maybe, possibly, in the right mood and moment, consider being witnesses of the resurrection and the gospel. And then Jesus obliterates all of their comfort and all of their expectations, and he says to them, even to Samaria and beyond to the ends of the earth. If you remember at that time, Jews hated Samaritans. They were considered not human. They were considered dogs. They were considered people that you could justifiably hate and be violent towards because of ages-old historical familial conflict. But here... The otherworldly, countercultural, counterhuman, counterearthly grace of God is reminding the disciples that the love of Christ endured their sin. And the love of Christ is not only for an ethnic people, but it's for all creation and all people. And so the challenge to the disciples, not only in Jerusalem and not only in Judea, but even to Samaria, their so called enemies, because remember what a neighbor is in the gospel, only in the gospel. A neighbor that we are to love, that we are to sacrificially pour ourselves out for, is, if, is anyone that we can see, smell, or hear. We believe in the sovereignty of God, that he has all things in whatever places, and he can use any circumstance and place and person for his good and for our restoration. And so God is saying, even if you don't like them, even if you, God forbid, hate them, even if you're not comfortable, you are still called to give them the otherworldly undeserved love that I have given you. We see here that witnessing, speaking and acting out of the grace of God is not passive, but it's intentional. It's focused and it's urgent. It's intentional, it's focused and it's urgent. Meaning that a Christian, no matter how mature or immature, no matter how young or old, no matter how experienced or inexperienced, our pursuit, our desire, and dare I say even our delight, should be to accept the grace of God and the resurrection victory of Jesus, and then to respond to that by grace in going to obey in speaking of the gospel, the very treasure that we profess to love and hold on to. The purpose of being witnesses of the gospel is that Christ is the one who leads us, that the Spirit is the one that we cling to and hope in, that compels us and strengthens us to go. It's not a human-centric thing, and this is tied intimately with the resurrection because without the resurrection of Jesus, we don't have to listen to what he has to say. He's just another guy that was killed. And if you don't know biblical history, do you know how many messiahs so-called that there were that said, I am the son of God, I am the one that will lead Israel out of oppression from Rome? Do you know how many there were? More than 30 in just that short period of time. You know what happened to all of them? They failed and they died and they were rejected. And yet Jesus not only had similar, if not the same idea of redemption, though not earthly, but eternal, 
but he said, I am the son of God. And just like the other martyrs, just like the other so-called saviors and messiahs, he went to the cross and was killed for our sins. But the differing factor is that he predicted, he promised, and he was resurrected. Death could no longer hold him. The grave was empty. And this is what we and the disciples are witnesses of. Christ reveals to us as disciples, our responsibility and work as a response to the gospel, as a response to the resurrection. Again, it's interesting to note that it's not about what we do, but it's about what we do in surrender and obedience and response to the Holy Spirit. And at this time, at this time in the narrative, in the story of the text, after saying this, after reassuring, after promising, after finally giving them one more reminder of their purpose and identity as recipients of the grace of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus is lifted to heaven. This is, I, I, I can't wrap my mind around this. Imagine if I just was lifted up at this point through the ceiling. Who does this? What does this mean? And as he's being lifted up, after spending 33 years on earth, around three years in full-time ministry with these hard-headed disciples that he loved epically and desperately, as he's returning to heaven, the final sign and symbol that he is not from here, he is the Son of God, he's returning to the Father, these disciples sit there with their mouths open, staring at the figure of Jesus being raised up in the sky, and the Bible tells us, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, that they just stared at him until they were unable to see him anymore as he was covered by the sky in clouds. And they were frozen. Luke closes the text by saying two men in white robes, meaning two angels, had to come down because they were not doing anything. They were not moving. They were not responding in faith. And the angels, I, 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 this is the way my mind thinks, so I imagine 11 guys just sitting there with their mouths open, looking at the sky, confused, and the angels kind of appear in white robes, and they're like looking at the disciples and looking at the sky, and looking at the disciples and looking at the sky, and they're like, what are you looking at? What's, what's up there? It's blue, it's clouds, it's normal, it's everyday stuff. And then the angels said to them, why are you standing here still? The Lord has come. The Lord has died. The Lord has been risen. He has gone back to heaven. He told you exactly what's going to happen. He has given you your purpose and your identity in him. Now go in faithful response and obey and live for the glory of God. Go and live as witnesses of the resurrection. The funny thing that even after all that Christ has just shared with them, the disciples were inactive. And it takes another divine intervention to not condemn, to not accuse, but to lovingly remind and encourage and push them to leave their comfort zone, to leave their homes, to go and be what Christ's love had freed them to be. This is our calling, church. It's nothing for us to gather here on Easter morning to simply celebrate and smile at each other and say, Christ has risen with nothing happening in response and surrender and most importantly, in actual obedience to the gospel. This might be challenging for some of us. Yes, the gospel is given free of charge. It is a gift of grace. But if we have truly been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if the cross is truly what frees us from our shackles and chains to sin and death, and if Jesus not only promised that he would cover our sins, but that he fulfilled his promise of being resurrected, raised back to life again in the empty tomb, in victory over our sin and death, and Jesus is clear in saying, now that I have redeemed you, in other words, paid for your freedom, you no longer belong to sin, but you belong to me. And as you belong to me by faith, here is what you are called to do. Out of my love, you are to be witnesses. Out of my love, you are to be my hands and feet. And out of my love, you are to go and share the gospel. Three things I want us to think about today. 
First one is this. Easter Sunday reminds us of the victory and power of God for us. It's pretty easy as a Christian to turn and maybe in some ways twist the gospel to make it about us. We are the main character. But notice the firm reading and the order of the words that we did intentionally. Easter reminds us of the victory and power of God as the primary figure for us. We are the ones following after him. We are the ones who have been redeemed by his blood. We are the ones who have received grace. And we are the ones being called to a life that turns and points back to him as witnesses of of the resurrection. What we celebrate is the victory of God over sin and death. What we celebrate is that he has freed us for the purpose of living as his people. If Christ has risen from the grave, this is our glory and this is our joy. But the gift of grace doesn't end in mere victory. We are given the Holy Spirit, the power of God, to then go and live in whatever capacity and whatever he calls and however he's equipped so that we might be truly the hands and feet of God. And if you haven't guessed it, whether you're a new Christian, you're not a Christian, or you're a veteran Christian, whatever that means, the, 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 the power of the witness of a Christian is not to win an argument, but it's in the way we witness in, in our actions and words the love of God first. Yes, there comes standards. Yes, there comes righteousness. Yes, there comes confession and repentance. But the purpose of the people of God is to be reflections of God's grace. That's the foundation and that's the epic wholeness of the gospel of Jesus. In fact, all throughout history, as the church explodes from Acts chapter 2 on, the church explodes not because people that came out of the church were theolo- theological experts and that won arguments and saying, don't be, don't be a Muslim, be Christian. And so people are like, oh, I lost in a debate, so now I have to be... No, it's actually in historical record, most notably in Roman historians, saying, as I see Christians... They are no different from anyone else, except for one thing. And it scares me as a Roman citizen that they're blowing up, that they're exploding in terms of gathering new Christians. And it's not by their arguments, it's not by hatred, it's not by saying you have to be be or look or sound exactly like us. The historian verbatim in Latin says, by the love that they show to strangers. By the acceptance of others in mercy, their numbers are exploding. It's interesting that we love Easter and we have no problems accepting the grace of God for us, that he died for my sins, that he was raised from the dead to give me freedom and victory, and yet we are so unwilling as natural, broken humans to accept that, have it transform us, and then to extend it to others. And yet we're reminded here today that Easter is a reminder of the victory and power of God for us as he leads us, as he loves us, and as he calls us. We must not forget this. That though we are powerless in our own selves, the victory of the resurrection and the promise of Jesus is that God lives within us in his authority for the purpose and glory of himself first. The second point today is this. All Christians are called to be witnesses of the resurrection. All Christians are called to be witnesses of the resurrection. I've said this before, and I want to constantly remind us of this, but there are no levels to Christianity. There are no level two, I'm level 97, Pastor Amandi's level 476. It, It doesn't work that way. We are either saved or we're not. We are either redeemed by the love of Christ and faithfully, not perfectly, striving to live our lives in a growing love and knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who rules over every part of who we are because as he was on the cross, he won victory over every single fiber and fabric of creation. So if you are a Christian, you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then no matter how immature, no matter how inexperienced, or the other side of that, you are, Christ and the Holy Spirit lives within us, 
and calls and empower us to be witnesses of his resurrection. Again, it's not to beat others into submission. It's not to outwit others, to trick them into becoming Christian. But by the witness of our lives, by the witness of our words, by the witness of our compassionate, generous, and merciful love for others, even the smallest and most inexperienced person is able to be a witness of Christ. To be a witness is not just in our words, but it's in our actions, our intentions. And to be a witness is to go and seek out opportunities, trusting that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do, and he is with me. We just got through a couple months of going through what the basics of the gospel was. And starting in the summer, early fall, we're going to be kind of talking specifically about this. What does it mean to be a witness in terms of specifically sharing the gospel with our words and discipling others? And I know that scares most of us. What does it mean to disciple someone else into the grace of God? Because there are many people in here who've even asked me, and I love this, this, this question and this desire. Pastor Paul, I, I really want a discipler. That's great. What's a discipler to you? I, I have no idea. I just want someone to disciple me. All right? Let me try to help you with that question then. What do you think a discipling relationship is? I don't know. You tell me. You're the pastor. Okay, that's cool. And, and this just tells me where we are in our understanding of the gospel. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not indifferent. It just tells me that we as a church are confused on what it means to simply being open and willing to walk with someone else in faith to be willing to share our experience of God's goodness, to be willing to share uh, our, our, our witness in, grounded in the word of God, and to be willing to share and also listen and have others fill us with godly love and encouragement with and for one another. A witness is someone who goes, who professes that Christ is Lord, and it does not matter who they are or how long they've been in the faith. And finally, the third point is this. True faith is marked or found by obedience to Christ. True faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior who died for our sins and who was raised from the dead. A genuine Christian is not marked by how loud they sing or what title they hold, but it's simply found in how we strive to faithfully obey Christ in all of our lives. Beloved, you and I can trust in the good news because of who Jesus is, because of how he embraced humility and suffering for us, of how he, even as the Son, the part of the triune Godhead, surrendered and obeyed the will of the Father who called him to leave the throne of heaven to become human and to become become our sacrifice and the lamb that was slaughtered for our sins. We can trust God in his word because he's not just promises, but he has fulfilled and he has finished his promise and his victory. The resurrection of Jesus we celebrate on Easter is not just a sign of victory of God's trustworthiness, but for us as the church, the resurrection of Jesus, as he's sharing with the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, for us is the starting pistol. It frees us from the blocks. It might not give us everything we want. Step one, step one A, B, step one C, D, step one E, F, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We want detailed, minute things that we can obey and check off. But it is the starting pistol that says, run the race that you have been given in Christ. Be faithful, be obedient, and the Holy Spirit will guide you and give you assurance and fill you, and sanctify you, and build you into the image of God. Many of us, obedience to Christ is hard because we have a hard time trusting him. We have a hard time believing that Jesus is who he says he is. We have a hard time differentiating between priorities of this world that seem important, which, again, I'm not saying sell everything or none of your jobs aren't important. They are. We're supposed to glorify God in everything we are and do. But some of us have a hard time differentiating or parsing the reality of our lives in this world versus the supremacy of Christ in this world 
And so we code switch. We flip back and forth. Okay, today I have to do this, and I'm really busy, and I have a project or an exam, so I'm going to worship at the altar of studying or worship at the altar of work. But man, today's Easter, so at least for a couple hours, I'm going to say Jesus is king, and he has died for my sins, etc. Do you know how exhausting that is? And do you know that you can't serve two masters? Let me just drive this whole point further by talking about why this is futile. I grew up, as many of you, as two ethnicities. I'm Korean and I am American. At a very young age, I realized that naturally, especially at church, I had to flip between who I was depending on who was walking towards me in the hallway. And I wrestle with it even today. If I'm walking down the hallway, and I call that hallway right there that leads to the KM sanctuary, the most dangerous hallway in the world, the reason is because there's, you can't hide anywhere. If you're going from here to the kitchen or the KM sanctuary, that long hallway, you're stuck. You're going there. Because no one's going to start walking down there and they see someone uncomfortable walking towards them. And halfway through, it's going to be like, oh, nope. And then just turn around and walk back. What, did you all forget your phones in the sanctuary again? And, And the reason why that hallway for me is not difficult but difficult is because depending on who's coming, I have to change who I am. And it happens every day of the week that I'm here. A lot of you guys are surprised that I'm here during the week. I work here full time. This is my job. I don't, I don't understand why they're surprised there. But if it's an EM member come this way, what do I do? I, I keep walking and I smile and I say, hi, how are you? If you don't know who I am, I say, I'm Paul. You know, if, you, if you're willing to stop and exchange pleasantries or ask a question, we'll have that conversation. But if it's not an EM member, if it's a kid, I don't really say anything because it's a kid and I scare them anyway. But if it's a Korean adult... My posture changes, the way that I walk changes, and I do the lizard face that a comedian tells us that we all do. Don't act like you don't do it. What do we do when we, find, when we see someone that we don't know what to say? We all do this. <laughs> this is like the universal respectful, like, how are you? I'm not going to say hi, but I acknowledge you. And if they're older, what do I do? I immediately say, 안녕하세요, and I bow. And then depending on how traditional they are, even if they're 90 years old, because I'm a pastor and that means I'm important for some reason, they bow back to me. Which again, in the Korean culture, I have to bow back again, lower. And it's like a contest of who can touch our toes. (laughs) The problem with this is if you take this one interaction in that hallway, and then you multiply it to the rest of our lives, do you know how exhausting that is? Do you know how emptying it is? And do you know how that if we continue in this pattern, whether they're English ministry or KM ministry, we don't care about that person. We just want to hurry up and do the interaction and leave. There's no connection. There's no communication. There's no compassion. There's no love. And this is how we mirror our lives. The world, school, relationship, business, education, money, comfort, feelings. And yet here is Christ saying, you know, that can be a part of your lives. God is sovereign over that. He's gifted you. He's called you work for God's glory. But work, study, have families, whatever. But is the supremacy, the kingship and the lordship of Christ, the one that shapes all those things and the one whom we are obeying? Not simply because he's articulate, but because he has promised to redeem our sins by his death on the cross for us. And he has promised to be resurrected as our sign of of victory over sin and death. What separates Jesus as Lord and Messiah is not what he promises, but what he has promised and what he has done. And that is the power that you and I are living out of. Nothing else. And this is why we say that true faith is not found in articulate speech, is not found in dress, It's not found in anything else but actual, faithful, not perfect obedience to Christ. Tim Keller says this, If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If you're a Christian, and if Jesus rose from the dead, then you as a self-professing Christian must accept everything that he said. But if he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? 
The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And today, what are are we celebrating? The resurrection of Jesus Christ over sin and death. What more do we need then? In fact, Jesus highlights this in various verses in John 14. This is verses 15 through 7. If you love me, if you believe me, if you confess that I am your Lord and Savior, you will keep my commands. Nothing about church attendance, nothing about how many years you've been at EPC, nothing about how you at least look and sound the part. He says, if you love me and profess that I am Lord and Savior, then you will keep my commands. That phrasing in the nerdy Greek is not just when you feel like it or from time to time or periodically, but that keep my commands, verb, active, directive, command is always. You will strive to always live under my rule and authority as someone who perfectly loved you. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Again, foreshadowing of what Jesus just says to the disciples before he goes back to heaven. The Holy Spirit will come, the great helper will come and empower you. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him because he lives in you. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments, simply by the fact that you're a professing Christian and you've been given the word of God, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest or live and become one with him. John 14, 23, 24, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep or obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home in and with him. And whoever does not love me does not keep my words. It's pretty black and white, isn't it? Even in English, it's pretty black and white. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. EPC, praise the Lord that Christ is risen. Praise the Lord that his victory over sin and death is victory for us in faith. That by faith, if we died with Christ to the grave, that by faith he will raise us up with him to life. But the life that he calls us to is not generic, it's not a suggestion, but the freedom of Christ and the life that he calls us to is found in the person and love and truth of Christ, as he calls us. Let us not be the disciples that stand there with our mouths open, looking up to heaven, wondering where Jesus went. EPC, why do we stand here and look up at the sky? Jesus, who has come to share and be the good news of God's grace for us, has gone to the cross. He has paid for our sins. And just as he promised, he has risen from the grave. And out of that, he calls us his own. And as his own children, he calls us for his purpose and glory. Let the words of a spiritual father, St. John Chrysostom, be the last thing you hear from me today. He encourages the church by celebrating this. He says, let no one, because of the cross of Christ, because of the resurrection of Christ, let no one mourn that he has fallen again and again. For forgiveness has risen from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the death of our Savior has set us free. Hell took a body and discovered God. It took earth and encountered heaven. O death, where is your sting? O hell, Where is your victory? Christ is risen. And the tomb is emptied of its dead. So to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Church, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we have purpose and direction and an identity in you. Would you forgive us in humility for being passive, for living either in ignorance, if we didn't know, or living in disobedience, if we have been consistently rejecting the purpose you have given us in your grace in the gospel. As we have reflected on, as we will continue to reflect on your death and in your resurrection, would you empower us in the Holy Spirit that you have gifted to us, that lives in us even now? And Lord, would you help us to respond 
in faithful obedience, not trusting in our ability, not trusting in our power, not trusting in even our plans or desires or hopes, but fully being surrendered to you in the gospel, that we would take a step-by-step approach in faith, that we would be witnesses of your resurrection. Whether it's in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, would you comfort us? Would you encourage us? Would you empower us? Heavenly Father, we celebrate you today as King, as victor over sin and death as you have been raised from the dead. And we thank you that in your glory that we find our hope. Answer your name we pray. Amen.